Hi, I'm Bob the Hollow, here to talk about Guinevere, Princess of Sunlight. The prologue to this story is the crossbreed experiments that I've discussed in my last video of Gods and Monsters, as Guinevere's dark corruption and the imprisonment of her daughter, crossbreed Priscilla, were likely the main catalysts that drove her to leave an Orlando. These experiments serve to explain many of the references that will be made in this video, and the dark within her is also a key component to the theories being discussed here. So, I'd suggest you watch that video first, if you haven't. Now, without further ado... In Dark Souls 1, we had learned about Guinevere's departure, and soon after the release of Dark Souls 2, a widespread theory was created, stating that she'd have been the founder of Haiti. The plenitude of items originating in Lordran that can be found in Drain Lake, such as Lloyd's Talismans, Divine Blessings, and many more, are a starting point suggesting that Lordran inhabitants made it to these lands. And then, of course, we have Hades' Cathedral of Blue. The architecture of the building isn't just inspired by an Orlando, it's a faithful recreation of it. And inside of it, we find the old Dragon Slayer, who makes this theory the most blatant it could possibly be, leaving no apparent reason to deny it. The game itself even seems to taunt any possible naysayers in the Divine Blessings description. Water blessed by an ancient goddess. Her name is long forgotten, and the Magic Academy of Melfia denies even her existence. In any age, there are those who refuse to see reason. It is their meddling that distorts the truth. There are also the Gwyn-like bird statues, and the painting garden connection that I made in Let There Be Dark to help further cement this idea. So, with this chapter so clearly laid bare by the game, the next questions in need of answers were where the hell is Guinevere now? And just what the hell happened in this place? And the most poignant answer I can give to these questions is Guinevere became the great dead one of the undead crypt and, ultimately, she became the rotten. The currently accepted theory is that the old lords of Lordran have reincarnated in Dringlick, but unfortunately that theory doesn't really stand up to scrutiny very well. The old ones of Dark Souls 2 drop their own souls besides the old souls. If the old lords had reincarnated as the old ones, then it would stand to reason that there would only be a single soul to be dropped. Take the Lost Sinner, for instance. Its soul is the item Soul of the Lost Sinner, and the old witch soul is an item that the sinner had in its possession. Not to mention the Duke's dear Freya and the old Pale Drake soul. The spider is the old one, but the old soul doesn't even drop from the spider, it's on the floor. You literally walk over to it and pick it up from the floor. Usually after you kill a boss, you either absorb its soul or, more commonly, use it for crafting an item. From that point forward, the soul is gone and could be made to fit into the reincarnation theory if you really wanted to. But the thing is, we neither absorbed nor crafted from the Lord Souls in Dark Souls 1. We placed them in the Lord Vessel. They continued existing and could not be reincarnated. But Lord and Gods did, in fact, come to Dranglet though and the Lord Vessel can be found in Majula, broken to pieces in the basement of the old mansion. This is a clear indication that the old souls were items physically transported to this land, rather than having been reincarnated here. Guinevere had left an Orlando prior to Dark Souls 1, 
and she couldn't have brought the Lord Vessel herself, but this is a perfect fit for my Painting Guardian connection, since they would have come here after the events of the first game to bring her the painted word of Ariamis, and could have easily brought the Lord Vessel along as well. All with the blessing of Gwyndolin, who was still alive and ruling on Orlando, judging by what is seen in Dark Souls 3. And, uh, well, this is a Pandora's box argument, as it would allow any character to be the reincarnation of any other dead character in the series, especially if you mix it with the other Pandora's box, which is time is convoluted. Now, with that out of the way, The Undead Crypt was built by the absent Great Dead One, who is easily associated with the Rotten and also largely believed to be a reincarnation of Grave Lord Nero, with both conclusions being reached through the old Dead One soul that we can get from the Rotten since, besides the obvious name reference, that soul can also be used to craft a crypt black sword. But, as I have shown, reincarnation is not an option. So, how then did I arrive at the conclusion that this entity was actually Guinevere? The two most noticeable clues come from the Milfaniros and the engraved depictions of the Great Dead One. The Milfanitos were created and eternally served the purpose given by the Great Dead One. And, with the exception of the one caged in Drangley Castle, they have never left the Shrine of Amana. The combination of these circumstances imbue the divine blessings that they gift upon us with greater meaning, making these items a strong connection between the Great Dead One and Guinevere herself. And then, there are the engravings in the Undead Crypt. Here, the Great Dead One is shown to have been a female entity, a giantess with a skull for a face. And beyond that, the crypt also shows us that she didn't always have that face, also being depicted as a fair maiden instead. The depiction not only paints the great dead one as the spitting image of a saint, it also helps us physically connect the crypt to Guinevere since it can also be found in the Cardinal Tower, next to Haiti, on the far side of both Alken and Van. This tower wasn't a proper land unto itself, as one might call it. Being a tower, it was merely part of a larger state, and this saintly statue combined with its aforementioned position relative to Haiti, connected to that place through Majula, which stands atop the Grave of Sands, indicates that this tower was, indeed, an extension of Guinevere's Haiti. And even though the distance between the crypt and Haiti seems great at first glance, the forked road creates a direct pathway between the two, linking Majula to Drangley Castle, where the crypt lies underground. Remember that Haiti Set's description states that it is not known whether Haiti was the name of a kingdom or just the land between the Cathedral of Blue and the Tower of Flame, and I believe that it was, at some point, the capital of a larger kingdom that encompassed most of the territory that comprises Drang Lake today. The idea of an extended Haiti isn't actually new, but I'm going to disclose my perspective on it. And, to build upon this point, it is worth making a note regarding the old knights patrolling Haiti, which seem to have been made in Broom Tower, and the statues beneath the Cathedral of Blue, which appear again in the shaded woods along the path of the Forked Road. Though, here, 
we can now only find the dilapidated heads of those same statues, built to what must have been colossal proportions. Their presence implied that this area as well would have been a part of the same kingdom as Haiti. And uh, Winnever's kingdom wasn't just much larger than what we had thought, it was also much stranger as well. Despite what would have been our most intuitive conclusion, I believe that away from an Orlando, in this new land that she had founded, Winnever's dark corruption wasn't kept a secret at all. The dark power wielding old dragon slayer stands guard in plain sight after all. And the crypt was also not hidden from the world, judging by Egdane's description of it, when he says, Some were rich, others poor, some wise, some dull, but now they are all just dead. This open acceptance of the dark corruption that would have been responsible for her transformation, much like Belka's transformation described in non Verior Nox, helped shape this land in more ways than one. Starting, of course, with the building of the crypt where the undead may rest in peace. But it also meant the acceptance of other forms of magic. Guinevere married one flame god Flan, as we had learned through the Sun Princess Ring, and I believe the lost sinner to be this flame god after he had turned to the practice of paromancy. The lost sinner is called a she in English, but I haven't found any gender specific descriptors in Japanese, and personally, the lost sinner just always looked very masculine to me. Being in the possession of the old witch soul, he may have tried to recreate Isalif's undertaking and doomed Haiti in the process, explaining why that land was subsumed by the sea and why the lost sinner would feel compelled to eternally punish itself for the sins of its past. The sinner's flame, by the way, is still visible today atop Haiti's own Tower of Flame. This link to pyromancy and Isalif can also be seen in the Shrine of Amana, which had already been connected to Guinevere since the Rise of the Dead is protected by pyromancers and the elevator that leads to the Shrine, well, it floats. As far as I can tell, this is the only floating elevator in this game and in Dark Souls 1, the only floating elevator was the one leading upwards from the location of the demon Fire Sage, making this contraption an example of Isalif's technology. Another interesting fragment of this society was the presence of witches. First, we'd have the Lydia witches, who once served in the undead crypt and wielded all forms of magic. And the very beginning of the Forked Road pathway, on Haiti's end, is called Old Akelahe, or Old Witches' Gathering Place. This acceptance of witches in its culture also allowed for the creation of a cathedral dedicated to Velka slash Kaifa in Tseudora, another location connected by this very same Forked Road, and that would have been a part of Winiver's Kingdom. Moreover, there is one last statue in this road that should be of interest, yet another maiden statue. Her garments may suggest more proximity to witches rather than sands, and the sunflowers at its feet seem like a reference to the Princess of Sunlight to me. A reference that may appear again in the Iron Keep, but... We'll talk about the Iron King later on the video. For now, let's turn our gaze back to Tseldora, the Duke and the Dragon within. Along with the reincarnation theory, there's always been the notion that Sif had conducted experiments in this land. 
This idea is spurred primarily from the old Pale Drake Soul that can be acquired after fighting Freya and was backed by the presence of Tark, Najka and the Lion Clan. And even though these pieces stand out prominently as evidence to the experiments, without the reincarnation theory, this whole scenario would seem cobbled together for no particular reason. Gladly, this problem can be easily fixed if we consider Tseudora a vassal state to Guinevere's kingdom. Guinevere granted the old Pale Drake soul to the Duke in hopes of continuing the crossbreed experiments she had taken part of, and, in light of the arguments I presented in my latest video, we can even add more pieces to this puzzle. Tark and Najka are not only reminiscent of Kellogg and the Fair Lady, but also, when combined with the Lion Clan, serve as a reference to the Sanctuary Guardian. And the Lion Clan on its own can be more easily reconciled with the experiments when using the Undead Parish Relief as a reference. The key for the original experiments were Chaos, Dark, Divine and Scales of Immortality, and this can all be found here. Guinevere could have provided both Dark and Divine, since she was both a goddess and a hexer, and in Velka's Cathedral, for instance, we can see both these forces side by side in the Prowling Magos and Congregation boss fight. Dark is also abundantly present in weapons wielded by the inhabitants of this place and, while chaos may be hard to find in Tseudora, the Duke did, in fact, have access to it. The Brightstone key that we get from the Duke himself unlocks a room with a fire seed and the great fireball pyromancy, both of which seem very out of place in this town, but do fit perfectly with the crossbreed theory. And regarding dragons, well, there's an ancient dragon's corpse here. And the path from Tseudora to Dragon Peak through the Forked Road, plus the Pardoner set that can be found in the peak, would indicate not only access to other dragons, but also a possible origin for the corpse in Tseudora since its origin is never explicitly stated, there are no actual ancient dragons in Dragon Peak, its memory doesn't take place in a cave, and the cave itself seems a bit cramped for its size. A bit of a side note here is that the Duke and other residents of Tseudora were the same kind of clothes as Mothlin, meaning they must have been originally from Vogan. I believe this connection is well known, but I think it's also interesting that this fact could explain why Mothlin, Cloane and Lenigrast would have come to Drunk Lake in the first place. Cloane, specifically, would have taken an interest in Seldora, since that place is known for its brightstone, and she is a stone trader. In fact, she may very well have been there already. She very strangely sells the Soul Apis miracle, which is said to have been preserved only in the undead crypt. It is very odd that she would possess this spell, but Soul Vortex, another crypt spell, can also be found in Tseudora, so... I think she acquired Soa Peas while searching for Brightstones and eventually wandered her way towards Earthen Peak, since it seems that the ravine in Huntsman's Copse is a continuation of Tseudora, creating a direct path to where we find her lost in thought. And the last piece of lore to be extracted from Tseudora is the name of Guinevere's kingdom, which I believe to have been Olafis. The first clue to this theory comes from the placement of the Staff of Wisdom, which is wielded by Strayed of Olafis and that can be found in Tseudora. 
also worth mentioning are the Helix Halberd, which is believed to have been created in Olafis and can be found inside the Shrine of Amana, and the Soul Boat spell, which was created by Strayed and is found just before the entrance to that same shrine. Strayed is also the only character to speak about the Lords of Lordran in more detail, indicating that Olafis existed in a time where their history was not yet completely forgotten in this land. But the most important clue comes from Strayed's pyromancies. Strayed created the Flame Swap pyromancy, which has similar effects to the old sun ring found in the shaded woods. Worship of the sun is a thing of the past in Drang Lake, but the shaded woods were part of Winnever's kingdom, and the ring's motif fits perfectly with the culture of that time. And since the game distinctively draws attention to the fact that Strayed was a master jeweler through the Dispelling Ring's description that says, there is only one sorcerer who could have done this, a man from the lost land of Olafis. Then, I believe that Strayed was also the creator of this particular ring. Now, Flame Swath later became the Profane Flame Pyromancy in Dark Souls 3, and the Profane Flame itself had a similar effect in the Profane Capital as the one seen in Haiti, creating a never-ending flame and bringing forth the destruction of the land. So, Strayed's Pyromancy would not only have been the basis for the creation of the old Sun Ring, but it would also have been used by Flan, in conjunction with the knowledge granted by the old Witch Soul regarding the Chaos Flame during the creation of the Sinner's Flame. And it is also worth considering that the description of the ring alludes to our deeds coming back to haunt us, such as the sin that the lost Sinner punishes itself for. The ring is triggered by damage inflicted to its wielder, which is reminiscent of the self-damage inflicted by the Lost Sinner's Penal Mask, and that the effect of the explosion, leaving the wearer of the ring unscathed, would explain how Flame could have survived the cataclysm that sank Haiti into the sea. The place where Strayed can be found today, the Lost Bastille, stands on top of what used to be the Kingdom of Alken and Along with Van, these two would have been a part of Olafis. The two kingdoms are stated to have existed at the same time, and we can use logic to show that they existed in the same era as Olafis. First, just like the Tower of Flame isn't the entirety of Haiti, the Bastille isn't the whole of Alken either. The rest of it has been subsumed by the sea indicating that Alken has befallen the same fate as Haiti when the Sinner's Flame was created. And second, the Iron King's Kingdom seems to be the last of the Great Kingdoms prior to Drang Lake, and he wrested Broom Tower from Van, meaning Van could not have predated Olafis. And considering how the old knights patrolling Haiti in the Shrine of Amana would have been made in Broom, then Van could not have been created after Olafis either, placing both kingdoms at the exact same point in time. Also, the Scorching Iron Scepter says the Iron King was weak and that Broom Tower granted him the strength to forge the mightiest kingdom of his time. If the tower made his kingdom powerful, then it would have made Van powerful as well. And if he was a weak king, then he wouldn't have been able to wrest Broom from Van if Van still had that kind of power, meaning that the kingdom of Van had already fallen by the time the Iron King came around. Now. Alken and Van were vassal states, 
kingdoms in their own right that still owed allegiance and obligations to Olafis. These two kingdoms share the same founder. The founder is worded as man in English, but the Japanese description doesn't mention the founder's race, which is important because a man would likely preclude a god. And being under the rule of a prince and a princess, this would have been the son and daughter of the king who granted them these fiefdoms, and their blood relation would explain why their love was forbidden. And I say king, because even though we've been discussing Olafis as being Guinevere's kingdom, Flan would have been its king and, most likely, its ruler. This particular statue is present in both the Bastille and the Iron Keep, and is possibly a depiction of Flan himself. In the Keep, the statue is even accompanied by a statue of Guinevere, the Great Dead One. They have all been bound with chains that are held in place by swords. This would probably have been done either by the Iron King when he first occupied the keep or later by Vendrick when he visited this location. Both would have the same meaning of conquest over the previous rulers of this land. Remember that even though it is said that the Iron King built the keep, the Scorching Iron Scepter leaves no doubt that the Iron King was not the ruler of Van, and the Bell Keepers leave no doubt that the keep was a part of Van. The only logical explanation is that the keep was originally built by Van and later rebuilt by the Iron King. Despite his true feelings, the Prince of Van was married to Mitha. One detail that usually seems out of place in Earthen Peak is the presence of Grave Wardens, but they can actually help link Mitha to Guinevere. Considering the many undead workers in the Peak and also that she was a member of the royal family, then I'd say Guinevere lent both the workers and warders from the crypt. The workers helped with the construction of the tower, transporting stones from the quarry below, and the wardens watched over them. And the presence of a hairs of the sun statue, combined with the pattern on the ceiling of the area where you fight Mitha, which is also present in the Tower of Flame, makes me think that this tower may have been originally meant to be a place of worship. Later, she'd become queen to the Iron King and impart the knowledge of the peculiar art of puppetry, which is a vestige of the two lost lands, giving him the power to grant life to heaps of iron. And while on this topic, I would be truly remiss not to mention the old king's soul, which is believed to have been the soul of Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. This old soul is acquired as a drop from the old Iron King boss and, just like the other ineffable souls, this one too was brought in from Lordran, but unlike Nero in the Bed of Chaos, we actually got Queen Soul as a regular boss soul item in Dark Souls 1. The Lord Vessel did not hold Queen Soul, it held two of his soul shards. There's always been many unanswered questions regarding this scenario and to properly explain it, we need to talk about Nitha, the shards and the smelter demons. First, let's make a couple of distinctions between the Smelter Demons in Broom Tower and the Iron Keep. The first difference is that while the one in Broom is magical, the one in the Keep is fire-based. This can be observed in their color and the damage of their weapons. 
The second difference is that the one in Broom is the original, and the one in the Keep is a recreation. This is inferred by the one in the Keep having a regular sword, while the one in Broom has an aged sword. Which doesn't actually mention an old Iron King, just an old king instead. And these demons aren't built, they are summoned. As it is implied by the phrase, the earth spouted fire, and a beast arose from the flames. And their souls state that the Iron King was killed by one such smelter, while suggesting it may not have been his creation, which usually would imply it had been created by Guinevere's son, the original ruler of Van. But the aged smelter's word casts doubt upon that as well. So, the power to animate automatons was given to these kings. Mitha wields the power of puppetry, and the aged smelter demon is even called a puppet in its words description, indicating that she gave them the knowledge necessary to create the smelter demons. The aged smelter was magical, probably because she'd have participated in its creation directly, while the keep's smelter is fire-based, because the Iron King was probably assisted by Aigil, his faithful pyromancer. Also, we know the Iron King had a shard from Windsoul on him when he died, since he drops the old King Soul. And it may not be a coincidence that there are two smelters, just as there were two shards. I think they may have been necessary for the ritual. The arena of the smelter demons seems like a summoning site, and the statues at its sides, with the women holding the flower and the flame, remind me of that forked road statue with the maiden and the sunflowers. I think these saint-like women are a reference to Guinevere and her saints. And to further link Mitha to these shards, well, the Iron King was obsessed with pyromancies and Sir Alon's katana had bleed, but no lightning. Yet, strangely, the Alon Captainites carry lightning katanas. Not only that, but their lightning is blue instead of the traditional yellow, which might indicate that this particular form of lightning is actually magical in origin. Everything around the Iron King is fire and pyromancy, but his queen was a sorcerer, so she's probably the one who used the shard to create this power as well. So, I think this is a pretty detailed description of this scenario, but we still need to address the discrepancy created by the idea of Gwyn's soul reincarnating as a fire-spewing demon. We've been over both the reincarnation aspect and the old king's soul, and the demon aspect, I think, is incidental in this equation. The Iron King had the shard on him when he sank, and his body was possessed by a demon two separate events that happen to the same character. Now, we'd still need to find an origin for the demon that possessed him, and I think that the best alternative is the Smelter Demon Ritual. The Smelter is called a demon, it was summoned, and they most likely used pyromancy in said ritual, so I think it's feasible that they unknowingly summoned more than just the out-of-control heap of metal that killed the Iron King. To be honest, I'm not completely satisfied with this explanation, and I'll keep looking for either better alternatives or 
more pieces of evidence to support this theory. And, well, there's always the possibility that there are just demons living down there, right? And after all that, I believe Mitha still has one last part to play in this story. We have already established that she was married to both the Iron King and, before that, to Guinevere's son, the original ruler of Van. But I'd propose that she was already royalty even before that. In the peak, we can also find the desert sorceresses, and I believe that Nitha was their queen in the land of Yugo. Some people might get the first impression that they are not related because Mipha is a sorcerer and these mistresses wield fire and must be, therefore, pyromancers. But lest you think they being called sorcerers is just an oversight, their title is actually backed by the game since they don't cast spells using a pyromancy flame but rather a catalyst. Unlike Zoe in Dark Souls 3, who is an actual pyromancer, but is merely a descendant rather than an original. Fire sorcery isn't even new to the game. The witches of Isolith wielded fire-based sorcery long before they had created pyromancy. And Mipha is called the fairest queen in the land, which goes in tandem with the desert sorceress's enchanting looks, which are present in both their set's description and, well, in their bodies. And their homeland may not even be that far away, since the corrosive ants whose anthills line the horizon of the desert land of Yugo are making their way into Shuva and the gutter. And the gutter also holds another interesting remnant of Yugo, the Oro's armor, worn by the kings of the desert land and, if the king and queen of Yugo left towards Olafis, then that must mean their homeland had already fallen. Now, it's important to note that the queen made it to Ban, but the king's armor is in the gutter of all places, implying that he must have died here. And now I'd like you to consider the description. Desert sorceresses have enchanting looks and they use them to catch people off guard. Even those who are perceptive enough to realize the ploy fall prey to their seductions with alarming regularity. Do you see it now? Her first husband dead in that cave, her last killed by one of her creations. Did she kill all of them? All of her husbands? Did a smelter demon kill the ruler of Van just like another killed the Iron King? The destruction wrought by the sinner's flame doesn't seem to have reached this far inland, but amidst the chaos that ensued, did she join the turmoil and turned on the prince too? Before I continue, I need to talk about the DLC portals for a bit, as I think they were built by Guinevere and all of his. These DLC doors have many engravings on them, and the important ones are the suns as the forgotten practice of worshipping the sun would signify this shrine's origins. Regarding the areas that they connect to, Brun is a bit of a given, since the kingdom of Van was ruled by Guinevere's son. Ilion Lois was built around a portal that leads directly into Chaos, which would have been valuable for Guinevere's continued crossbreed experiments. So, I think she first built that place in order to gain access to Chaos and later, once it became either irrelevant or unsustainable, she stopped supporting the effort. 
the land was left to fend for itself and, amidst the ensuing exodus, the Ivory King found both an opportunity and a calling. Shuva houses Sin, which would also have been useful for her experiments, and I'll expand on the Sunken Kingdom now, but before that, let me just mention the fourth of these portals. The one in Things Betwixt, where we start the game. It lacks the shrine in the middle and the stone tablets around it, but the ground pattern is the same. So, this one too would have been built by Guinevere, which she probably used to facilitate contact with the world outside these borders. Going back to Shuva, we need to add it to the list of Olaf's vessel states. A kingdom that was built directly beneath Haiti, as the puzzling stone sword's description links it physically to the gauge. And even though Shuva is more widely known by its ancient dragon, I believe it was originally just a regular, heavily tasting state. The presence of a clergy is made obvious by the priestesses, the cardinal who created the miracle denial, and the many depictions of clerics scattered in the form of engravings and statues. And what leads me to the conclusion that Shuva wasn't originally built in order to worship Sin is the lack of dragon iconography outside the Dragon Sanctum. Regarding its relation to all of this, the priestesses wield dark powers, but that wouldn't have been strange in Guinevere's all of this, considering the old dragon slayer and the Lydia witches of the undead crypt. In these statues, help us connect Shuva to Guinevere through the statues littering the Black Gauge, the same ones the Rodan is found trying to restore. This bigger version of those same statues, found in the Cave of the Dead, give us a more clear image of the saintly nature of their figure. Other connections to Guinevere are that both Shuva and the Shrine of Amana have towers of prayer, that the Old Knight Great Shield has an engraving that looks like the Mayan representation of the sun, and Shuva is the only place that has engravings with a Mayan motif, and also from those suns on the DLC doors, since they can also be found on Shuva's rotating gates. And the last connection comes from Lindelt in the Drake Blood Knights. I have disclosed this theory before, but I think it's worth revisiting it for the purposes of this video. The Lindeld Cleric Knights of the Archdrake sect are descendants of the Drake Blood Knights. This fact is easily unraveled by juxtaposing the Miracle Replenishment and the Archdrake's slumbering dragon shield. The Miracle says these miracles is used by the resolute Lindelt cleric knights. There is a story passed down for generations, claiming this band of knights once felled a poisonous dragon, which menaced an entire nation. Meaning, of course, sin. And the shield, a secretive item used in covert rituals, explains that the fools who woke the slumbering dragons earned not only its ire, but also the destruction of an entire country. The survivors buried their wrongdoings in the past and, in a show of terrible conceit, attempted to make amends by carrying on the knowledge of the wasted land, meaning that they changed history to fit their purposes and spun a fictional story that was fed to the public, all the while keeping secret records of the truth. And the pattern on the dragon charm is also present in Lindelt's monastery charms, which serve the exact same purpose. So, the connection between the Drake Blood Knights, miracles, and the worship of the gods becomes clear in their later endeavor, and with this in mind, their existence during the times of Olafis would suggest a relationship to Guinevere which can be further illustrated 
by the differences between the dragon and monastery charms. The monastery charms are made by humans and are only a less effective recreation of the original rituals that blessed the dragon charms. And the dragon charms description. It is not clear whether it is a man-made creation or of some other nature would indicate that the originals were blessed by a god, that is, Guinevere, rather than a human. Now, given all these arguments, I conclude that they served Guinevere and were sent to Shuva on her behest. She needed dragons for her crossbreed experiments and, fostering a secretive enclave of mystical beliefs and heady fanaticism, would allow her to conscript unwavering dragon hunters under her command. Shuvas worshipped strayed too far from the flock, and they denied Guinevere her prize, who sacrificed the herd in an altar of poison, blood and despair. At first glance, the lore of the Dark Chasm seems self-contained. Portals that lead into the abyss, and the dark divers that tend to them. The three portals are all dilapidated and seem to be randomly scattered, mostly tucked away in unassuming corners of the land. But, just like the DLC portals, there is a fourth Dark Chasm portal, this one located in the Rise of the Dead, between the Shrine of Amana and the Undead Crypt. You may not have noticed it, because it is never used as a portal, but it stands beneath and around the shrine that you can pray to in order to undo your hollowing. This particular instance serves to show us the origin of these portals, built by the dark embraced former Princess of Sunlight. And they also help connect some of the areas we have discussed. These pillars around the DLC shrine are of the same kind as the ones around the chasm portals, the crumbled ruins in Shrine of Amana, and inside the chasm itself. The whole ground pattern can also be found inside Shuva, and this detail of the same pattern can also be found in Alken. But these portals aren't just connecting their locations to the abyss, they're connecting these locations to each other. This concept is illustrated by Grendel's ability to appear in each location, despite their general inaccessibility and Grendel's impairment. And the fact that all three portals lead to the arena of the Dark Lurker, which could be seen as a crossroads of this system. And so, at least functionally, the Dark Chasm portals are connecting the Shrine of Amana, Seudora, and the Black Gauge. The Shrine of Amana is connected through the portal beneath Drang Lake Castle, which is located just before the entrance to the shrine. Seudora is connected by the portal in the Undead Ruins, and the Black Gauge portal not only connects the crypt to the Great Dead One's last location, it also connects what seems like a dragon skeleton which could be relevant to the crossbreed experiments, and also to the portal leading to Shuva and Sin. Since Guinevere herself had become a Hexer, and since both Dark Divers Grendel and Falcon are former clerics turned to Hexers, then I think that it stands to reason that Hexers have traditionally looked after the chasm since the times of Olafis, or more specifically, pyromancer hexers, based on the presence of the Dark Stalker near the Dark Chasm portal beneath Drang Lake Castle. The Dark Stalkers dropped the pyromancer's tattered cloth set, and their fear of fire would indicate they have witnessed the horrors of the Sinner's Flame. And the one near the portal also drops the judgment set associated with Velka in the dark. In order for Guinevere to become the Rotten, 
she would have used the power of the numbness spell that can be acquired from the old dead one's soul which she possessed and that allows for the manipulation of flesh. And the reason for her to do so isn't stated but, as usual, it can be inferred. First, the numbness effect of reducing damage taken would suggest that she needed to protect herself against something. This clue could be compounded by the butcher knife's secondary effect that restores her health when hitting enemies. And the reason why she needed this protection, I believe, is hinted at by Dark Fog. This hex is found just before the entrance to the Black Gulch and states that, even though its effects are indiscernible from poisoning, it is actually the Dark eating away at the target's inner essence. Considering the goat's notoriety for its abundance of poison, I think the Hex is explaining what actually assails the Rotten, and why she'd need the raised defense and health restoration. Remember that even though Guinevere is originally associated with healing miracles, the Rotten only uses dark powers, indicating that her shift towards the dark inside of her was complete and she was forced to resort to these measures. And the Butcher Knife also presents a couple of interesting links where all other items with this effect can be found in the gutter, those being the Ring of the Evil Eye and the Wicked Eye Great Shield, and also that this shield is wielded by the Sentinel Phantom outside the Cathedral of Blue. Now, considering that Dark Fog is a hex to be cast on a target, I think her quote-unquote poisoning was intentional. Let's take another look at her undead crypt and establish a timeline that would lead us to this end. Despite what's written on the brochure, the crypt is, functionally, a twofold illusion. For man, it was the illusion of peace, of escaping the fate of the cursed undead. But the crypt doesn't free the undead from the curse, it merely gives the illusion of becoming human through the shrine in the rise of the dead, and then imprisons them underground. And for the gods of Haiti, of which there must have been many, judging by the Sun Princess ring, the crypt was the illusion of control, the illusion that they could keep the undead at bay. But as the first flame waned, their numbers would keep rising, to the point where there'd be just too many of them, too many to bury, too many to control. At this point, the crypt was no longer enough, and Guinevere had planned to relink the first flame, to stave off the curse. This can be inferred by the location of the kiln at the entrance to the shrine of Amana, with two old knight statues at its doors just across a dark chasm portal. She would have failed in this endeavor, though, which can be deduced because the crypt still stands, meaning the curse wasn't undone. And in the present, we need to acquire the giant's kingship in order to make use of the throne of Wand, meaning she may also have lacked what it takes to make use of it, be it a specific item or just sheer power to do so. And that's when Flan comes into the story. The Sinner's Flame was his attempt at succeeding where Isalif had failed, trying to recreate the first flame in order to hold the gathering undead. But that didn't quite work as he had planned. After Alken and Haiti were engulfed by the sea, the undead turned against their former gods. Their numbers were likely already greater prior to this event, and they were naturally more likely to survive the cataclysm. The surviving deities were corralled to the Grave of Sands, where skeletons that are too big to be human, but just big enough to be gods, have all been chained inside their coffins. A ghastly end, not at all devoid of irony. 
regarding those who would have betrayed their former kingdom. We should probably start with the Drake Blood Knights. These knights, who became the Archdrake sect, founded both the Blue Sentinels and Lindelt, the land that would supersede Haiti. The origins of Lindelt have already been discussed, and the link to the Blue Sentinels is derived from the spirit tree shield that was wielded by the Drake Bloods, and is now given by that covenant, and the Grand Spirit Tree Shield wielded by Targray, which is a variant of that shield. The nature of both these endeavors gives us an insight into their mindset, with Lindelt being a land of miracles and worship, while also being keen on lies and murder, and the Blue Sentinels both using their influence as extortion leverage in Vogan, judging by Mufflin's dialogue, while also being invaders themselves, despite their stated goals. This is surmised first by the fact that Targray has a Morning Star, which was associated with invasions in Dark Souls 1, and also by the presence of the Red Sentinel Phantom standing guard outside the Cathedral of Blue. We need only apply this mindset to the scenario following the fall of Haiti to see how easily they would have betrayed the gods, most like spurred by vengeance regarding their losses in Shuva, including their leader Sir Yorg. And with this in mind, it's also easy to see the priestesses of Amana as traitors, since they walk side by side with the Lindelt cleric knights. The Haiti knights as well, at first glance, give the impression that they would have been loyal to Guinevere to the end, but it has always seemed odd to me that they wouldn't mind us killing the old knights. And while the presence of a single Haiti knight both in the Sinner's Rise and the Gutter would help connect the lost Sinner in the Rotten to Flan and Guinevere respectively, giving the impression they would be there to protect their monarchs. They actually don't mind us passing them by and heading towards those bosses at all. That can only mean they aren't there to protect the king and queen, but to make sure they stay where they are. And finally, the Hexers. It's quite easy to see their betrayal in the aforementioned Dark Fog argument, and given their connection to the Dark, isn't it befitting as well? Guinevere held on to her illusion of power to the bitter end, but, as it turns out, you can't really hold on to that which you never had to begin with. Some final thoughts to bookend this video. I'd like to say that there's a possibility Guinevere was moved by genuinely misguided good intentions when she built the crypt, born from sympathy for those who shared her dark corruption. But, you know, her fate was the same either way. There is also a possibility of the lost sinner being Guinevere's daughter instead of Lan, but this option would require far more assumptions on our part, so... Occam's Razor. Strayed was involved with the Sinner's Flame, and he also sells the Dark Fog Hex that we talked about earlier. So, he might have been involved with the Hexer's betrayal of Guinevere as well. This makes me think that the whole thing may have been planned, that the fall of Haiti may have been a cool of sorts and that he was petrified by the perpetrators in order to erase their tracks. This sounds very interesting and intuitive to me, but it's just speculation at this point. I think the emblem on these shields is inspired by Roman shields, but don't 
quote me on that. Either way, in game, the wings really remind me of the moonlight butterfly. And the spear and the eye looking thing in the middle remind me of the channelers. Was this like a welcome sign from those who came to continue Sif's experiments? A hello carving of sorts to those who might follow. This worker in Sodora is my hero. I love that guy. If you can guess why, tell me in the comments. Let's see who gets it right. And lastly, is this Hades water tower? The Lost Sinner's lore in Japanese is so gender neutral that a specific Japanese wiki actually turned to English descriptions in order to reach the conclusion that the sinner is a she. The man who became the Darkstalkers would have been deformed by the chaos used in the creation of the sinner's flame. The giant hogs in Tseudora draw up divine blessings which can help further connect that location to Haiti. There's a variation of the interlacing pattern from the Dark Chasm portal that can also be found in the Undead Crypt, the Grave of Saints and Drangley Castle, which was built on top of the crypt. There's the circle pattern on the reliefs around the DLC portals. I think they might be related to these symbols found in the Grave of Saints. About the bonfire, Harvel's resting place in the Grave of Saints. The Japanese version states that Harvel was a cleric, and resting place means he's dead here, not that he used this place to take a breather, as I've seen been assumed before. Considering that the Red King lives in the Grave of Saints, I'd say it's safe to assume that the ones who broke the accord between Reds and humans were the gods that came from an Orlando. And I should probably address the hollow on the rodent's shoulder and the pharaoh's lockstone that you can get by cutting one of the rodent's arms. I've seen people theorize that maybe that hollow is pharaoh's and that pharaoh's is the rodent, since the hollow and the rodent move in unison. Well, I ran some experiments hitting that hollow with arrows and there's absolutely no difference in damage or any other effect. Considering they went through the trouble of coding separate hitboxes for the arms and the accompanying animations and loot for chopping them off, I'd say that if that hollow were the actual rotten, they'd have programmed something for him as well. I think that Hollow isn't controlling the Rodan's body, it's just being controlled just like every other Hollow in there, but since he's sticking out of the body, then he's just doing whatever the body does instead of acting as part of a limb. And since the rats weren't in good terms with the Sands, and since Pharaohs seems to have been allied to the rats at some point, then I think he just hunted Guinevere down, lost the fight, and became just another mindless hollow inside her new body. Considering the presence of all the restorative items in the gutter, that is, the ring of the evil eye, the butcher knife, and the wicked eye great shield, plus the presence of the ant queen, whose emissions can actually heal poisoning, I'd say that not all of Guinevere's followers turned on her. Some actually tried to help her. The hollows in the area wield dark infused weapons and we can also find the dark pyromancy flame in the gutter, which would also suggest these people may have been her followers at some point. That would also explain why they seem to worship the saintly statues in the area. And I somehow forgot to explain the statues in the video, but I think that the cutscene that plays when we first meet the Rodan 
where she's trying to reconstruct one of the statues, symbolizes Guinevere's longing for her past self. And lastly, for Rio this time, if it cannot be observed, it does not exist. Certainly a common conception, but one with far too many exceptions in this world. A hint about hiding, hidden in plain sight. Cool. That was a long video. But I think it was worth it. Guinevere has always been a much beloved character for reasons. And uh, she actually deserves to have her story told. Especially considering the widespread misconception that she'd be the Queen of Lothric, which a lot of people seem to believe. It's also worth it simply for the pleasure of delving into Dark Souls 2's trove of unexplored lore. I'm still not sure, but the next video will probably be about Vendrick. There's another Dark Souls 2 theory that I'm crafting at the moment, and uh, I don't know which will be completed first. Either way, there will be more lore coming soon enough. Thank you very much for watching, as always, a big thank you to all who help support this channel, Patreon, Vinny, John, Ethan and Sinclair. The link to my Patreon page will be in the description, or alternatively, there will be some links to bail funds that you can support in order to help the people protesting in the US right now. There's also a link to my Discord server if you want to talk with me or other like-minded people. And uh, yeah, that's that. See you around.